I am Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. After three weeks, Mayor Bob Filner returns to his office at City Hall and another woman comes forward claiming sexual misconduct. We've heard a lot about the mayor and mediation, how it works, and why more San Diegans may use this method to solve disputes. Plus, back to school shopping season started early this year. How the school shopping season could impact holiday prices. And if you filled up your gas tank at the pump recently, you may be finding it a little easier on your wallet. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Supporters of private uh, first class Bradley Manning believe his 35-year prison sentence is too harsh. A handful of them gathered outside the courthouse today in Fort Meade, Maryland. For today's sentencing, Manning was convicted of giving hundreds of thousands of government documents to WikiLeaks. A military judge convicted the 25-year-old soldier last month of 20 offenses, including six violations of the Espionage Act. He could have received up to 90 years in prison. By the way, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is calling Manning's sentence today a tactical victory because he says he could be released on parole in eight years before finishing the 35-year prison sentence. The Army psychiatrist on trial for the 2009 shooting rampage at Fort Hood refused to call any witnesses in his defense today. Major Nadal Hassan is acting as his own attorney and faces the death penalty if convicted. He told the judge the deployment of American troops to fight what he calls, quote, an illegal war provoked him to carry out the attack. He's accused of killing 13 people at the Texas military base. Another day, another news conference regarding sexual harassment claims against San Diego Mayor Bob Filner. While recall supporters staged another petition drive, they were joined by the latest woman who claimed she too was a victim. KPBS Metro reporter Sandia Dirks joins us from the News Center. So let's start with the mayor. Do we know where he is? Well, according to sources at City Hall, he spent part of the day in mediation. That's a discussion that has included lawyer, lawyer Gloria Allred and her client, Irene McCormick Jackson. Uh, Jackson is the one who is suing the city and the mayor for sexual harassment. Also involved are the city attorney and members of the city council. But everyone is being tight-lipped about what's happening. This mediation process seems to have taken us from a lot of comment to a lot of no comment. And another woman has come forward today. What can you tell us about her? Well, her name is Diane York. She's a La Jolla woman. She says she met with the mayor three months ago to get his help with a predatory, a predatory loan. And she says he touched her bottom. And she shared a picture with CNN that she says marks the moment when it happened. It's hard to tell from the picture. But she says she is stepping forward now. And she did so at a press conference organized by the recall campaign. And there was another recall campaign today. What was their message? Uh, well, both Michael Palomari and John Cox were there. They're both organizing the recall effort and putting money into the campaign. They're both conservative Republicans and both opposed Filner long before these allegations of sexual harassment emerged. They say that they were out there to get out the word and collect signatures, but there are some grumblings in social media that the recall campaign, which started out as very bipartisan, may be beginning to tilt to the right. Meanwhile, the mayor's office is saying that the mayor is back at work this afternoon. So we don't know if mediation is over or just paused or really what will happen next. KPBS Metro reporter Sandia Dirks. Mediation is a word we've been hearing quite a bit lately in connection with the sexual harassment uh, lawsuit against the mayor. Peggy Pico takes a look at how mediation is becoming an increasingly popular alternative to court proceedings. Mediation is a legal option for resolving issues that range from divorce to civil litigation and even medical liability. And with recent budget cuts to the courts, mediation may soon become the quickest and easiest way to solve disputes. Here to talk about the process is Stephen Dinkin, president of the National Conflict Resolution Center, and welcome. Thank you. Stephen, what, is the, what legal matters are best handled in, in, in mediation versus, let's say, uh, in a court proceeding? Most matters can be handled in the mediation process from personal injury to medical malpractice, construction defect, real estate matters, divorce, community issues. 
There are a whole range of different types of cases. What sort of things cannot be handled in mediation? There are certain types of criminal matters, uh, felony charges that might not be appropriate for mediation, or if an individual has mental capacity issues and can't make their own decisions, uh, those types of matters wouldn't be handled in, in a mediation process. Walk us through the actual setting of a mediation. Who's there? Who's managing the mediation? Uh, how does it work? Typically, the mediation is held in a boardroom type setting around a table. Uh, the mediator is a neutral third party. It, it could be a retired judge or an attorney. And then often you have uh, the opposing parties and then attorneys who are representing the parties. Uh, and, and the attorneys are there and, the, and you're able to uh, mediate with an attorney. It just doesn't have to be one on one with the mediator, correct? Uh, at times, uh, uh, Mediations occur without the attorneys in the room, but uh, attorneys can be in the room and be part of the process, and they play an important role oftentimes in the mediation process. Well, these days, you were talking about it, that it's often in a boardroom. Do you have to be face-to-face -face with the, the opposing party that, that you're in mediation with, or can you do it via Skype, phone, in a different room? How does that work? Well, if uh, both parties are, are in the room, Oftentimes they're in, they're in two or in the same office or in two separate rooms, and so the mediator will shuttle back and forth to the rooms. But nowadays, uh, parties can be on the phone or, or use other you know, multimedia uh, processes to involve the party in the mediation. Do you think that's helpful? The reason I ask is because obviously you're in mediation because you can't come to an agreement on something. I'm sure tempers might be a little hot. I prefer, uh, as a mediator, to have the parties together. Uh, not necessarily in the same room, but where I can meet with them face-to-face -face, as opposed to having them on the phone or uh, by Skyping. Is the mediated decision legally binding, or if you don't like the settlement results, can you still go to court? Well, typically, uh, when individuals enter into a mediation, it, it's not binding. So they can walk away from the discussions and the, and the matter at any point. Uh, but once they come to a mediation, uh, if both parties agree, then uh, the the mediation agreement is binding. It's like a contract that would be recognized in court. How long does it typically take to resolve a, a case via mediation versus, let's say, uh, going through court? It depends upon the complexity of the case. Uh, some cases can be handled in a matter of three, four hours. Other cases might take uh, several days to get to a resolution. And my, I understand that w one difference in mediation is you you have some uh, different options as far as what the settlement is. It isn't just monetary. Exactly. One of the uh, uh, great benefits of mediation is a confidential process. So the confidentiality of the process allows the parties to come up with very unique and innovative uh, dis uh, resolutions. So they can craft different types of solutions uh, that might not be um, readily available in a court proceeding. For instance, can, do you have some examples? Well, in an employment matter, for example, uh, it does not necessarily have to be just a monetary decision. Uh, at, at times, uh, uh, an employee might just want a, a solid recommendation letter, or they might want to be moved into another division, or want more vacation time. Uh, so those are the types of, or, or maybe just basically an apology from the employer. Uh, so there's a whole range of different types of solutions that might satisfy both the employee and the employer that goes beyond just a financial agreement. And that doesn't happen in a courtroom? Typically not. Okay. Stephen Dinkin, thank you so much for the uh, update on this. My pleasure. There is another twist in that kidnapping and double murder case out of San Diego's East County. James DiMaggio's family wants to know if he was, if he was the biological father of two of his victims, Hannah and Ethan Anderson. Now, DiMaggio left a $112,000 life insurance policy to the children's family. The Anderson family disputes the suggestion DiMaggio was killed by an FBI agent in the Idaho wilderness. Back to school shopping has become the second biggest retail season in America, but this year parents are expected to spend less than they did last year. Peggy Pico has more on why and what it all means.
It's not your imagination. Back to school shopping has started earlier this year. Parents began looking for bargains for their school age and college age kids in July. Here with more on some why, why some retailers are worried about early shopping seasons is San Diego State's business administration professor Mira Kopik. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Now, Mira, <laughs> let's start with these back to school uh, supplies. How much is the average family expected to spend uh, on back to school shopping this year? This year, the uh, National Retail Federation anticipates spending to be about $635 per household, uh, which is about 8.5% below last year. So it's a little bit less. Why would it be less? Well, the economy's recovering, and uh, it just seems like it would go up. Well, the, the economy's recovery has been a little bit uneven. So uh, on the one hand, the tax holiday that we enjoyed last year is, is no longer. So 2% two, 2 off the top is for every household. The increase in sales tax in the state of California takes a little pinch, higher gas prices, and then stubbornly high unemployment, especially those that affect lower and middle income families, uh, require families to be a little bit more vigilant with their dollars. When it comes to back to school shopping, what sort of items are being either pushed on the public or the public wants? Um, Back to school is very different from the Christmas holiday shopping period because that's really in the gifting mindset. Here it's buying necessities. So on the one hand, you're looking at staple items, especially in clothing like jeans or socks or underwear uh, or uh, school supplies like back to school, like backpacks. Backpacks are sort really important. Sort of necessities. Important. Yes. Um, how important is this back to school shopping season uh, to uh, the overall retail economy? It's, it's very important. It's the second largest window of shopping window after the Christmas holidays. So retailers take it very seriously, and it's very important that they have a successful shopping season. Does it predict holiday seasons? Does it predict other things that yeah. are retailers and merchandisers looking at that? Like, how'd we do? We, we were in a slump for back to school? How does it it's, fare it out It's, it's a bit of a bellwether. They want to know where there's demand uh, because they kind of look at the trends, the shopping trends beyond the the core staples are people buying more electronics items are they buying so if, the, if they have a chance to order some additional items for the holidays most of the orders have already been placed but to, uh, to heavy up a little bit is very important to them so they really look to see what people are buying right now Oh, so a little bit of a predictor for the actual merchandise I know there's a term out there called creep and the idea that retailers are calling this where they're you're seeing seasonal merchandise like back to school earlier and earlier in the right. season than before um, how does that actually impact? Why, why are people doing that? Uh, you know, it, it's kind of a, a land grab from retailers. Um, and, and one starts it, they, they have to follow. And they want to anchor your mindset as a consumer uh, to, to be thinking about back to school. If it's too early, kids are just coming out of vacation. In June, you're not going to be thinking about it. You're not thinking about it, and nor do you want to. And, and sometimes that can backfire. Like uh, in the past when you've seen Christmas holiday items in the end of September, uh, that was a big backlash with Costco a couple of years ago when they had uh, Christmas ornaments in, in the stores. Um, but by extending the season, it, ch it changes the mindset of the consumer so they can actually be thinking about it. They could plan some of their things, and they can also drive some impulse purchases. Does that type of marketing, that sort of overlapping of the season, does it actually increase spending on projects? Are we seeing a, a revenue increase, or does it actually just spread out the amount that, you know, where you would be getting the money? Instead of just in September, you spread it out over three or four months. In, in the past, it has helped increase spending. Um, you know, the, the last couple of years, because of the, the post-recession, it's been a little bit more variable. But the intent is it, it extends, it, it increases the spending because it gets you to think about it more often and you remember things that you forgot. So you'll, you'll go back, oh, I forgot the backpack or I got, forgot these supplies or we need to get the jeans. So you're always top of mind with that specific holiday. Now, you brought up that sort of backlash back in Costco. I remember that when people were so offended by the idea right. that, you know, Christmas came out in, in September, I think. It was right. really early. Um, do you think shoppers get fatigued because we're overlapping holidays and pretty soon they become numb to it? The sort of marketing and, and crossover with this seasonal shopping? You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, consumers have not displayed that behavior. They will talk about it. In, in consumer research, they'll say, you know, I'm a bit fatigued. Uh, you might see it in, in dips. So a great example is in the Christmas holiday season. They get off to a bang at Thanksgiving, and then that those first two weeks of December is a real lull in shopping. They're kind of overwhelmed, and then they realize they have a deadline. Uh, so in that case, it's the Christmas holiday. Here it's 
school starts for their child. So they get back on the horse and, 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 they're, and, they're, and they're buying. Uh, so, so sometimes by stretching it, it, it does raise revenue, but, but it, it isn't consistent. Okay. And uh, the last question here is basically about this, uh, your advice for seasonal shopping. Should you shop during the season? Should, wait, should you wait for the sale? You know, uh, retailers have been very aggressive with sales for this season up front. And the, and the Christmas holidays is kind of a toss-up. Sometimes uh, the closer you get to the date, so this weekend and next week, weekend for back to school, those backpacks are going to be at the best discounts that you've seen all season. Um, Normally, you should um, kind of, when you need to buy it, you should buy it because it may not be there. Uh, the after sales have gotten shorter because inventory management systems have gotten better. Absolutely. We've noticed that, actually. Professor Mira Kopik, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Summer gas prices in the county are at the lowest level in almost eight months. It's welcome relief for most consumers, especially those who drive for a living. Thank God. I've been, I've been hammered for years on this stuff, and I'm really tired of it. Alex Homo is a pizza delivery driver and says he shells out at least 20 bucks a day on gas. Honestly, I, I, have to, I have to pay out of my own pocket to deliver pizza to someone. Like so many consumers, he says, it doesn't take much of a change to impact the budget. Even just like five, ten cents just kills me every time. It adds up. It, it totally adds up. But he says you don't have to deliver pizzas to know the cost at the pump is draining your resources. What I have to do is basically take fo food from my, from my mouth, honestly, and, and put it into the car is what, it, what ends up happening. As with anyone, you know, that's a normal thing. The good news is we've been paying far less for gas over the past month, and AAA reports the cost at the pump has fallen 29 days in a row to the lowest level since the end of January. The average per gallon of regular now $3.86. That's 21 cents less than a month ago. Hopefully the trend will last beyond the Labor Day weekend when many people tend to hit the road. Take care. And AAA reports gas prices have fallen throughout Southern California over the past month. A wildfire has forced evacuations and is threatening more than 2,000 structures near Yosemite National Park. The fire has quickly grown to more than 25 square miles, putting folks in hotels, homes, and camp buildings at risk. It's one of more than 50 wildfires burning across the western U.S. And buildings swayed in Acapulco this morning after a moderately strong earthquake hit. The 6.2 quake was centered about 60 miles east of the city. Cracks were found in the walls of the city's university, and it was felt some 170 miles away in Mexico City. No injuries reported. And about 300 tons of highly radioactive water is leaking from storage tanks at the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant. Tokyo Electric Power says they haven't figured out how or where the water leaked, but suspect it's through a seam. This is the fifth and worst leak since last year involving similar tanks at the plant. Gum chewing, foot tapping, loud typing, it would be hard to find anyone who loves these sounds, but for some people, repetitive noises like these can evoke uncontrollable panic and rage. They have a little understood but highly debilitating condition called misophonia. The term is still so new that researchers have only faint ideas about what's causing it. KPBS reporter David Wagner explains. When Alicia Pointer pictures her family's dinner routine, she usually sees an empty chair at the table. It looks like me taking my food and eating in my room, pretty much. Pointer has something called misophonia, which literally means the hatred of sound. The condition is not well understood, but Pointer knows that if she hears certain repetitive noises, she'll become extremely agitated. People with misophonia are each set off by different sounds but most of them say they can't stand chewing. I just get really panicked, upset. I start looking at the people, you know, giving them dirty looks. Um, you know, I, I now wear headphones or I just have to leave. Pointer's misophonia follows her everywhere, from home to work to travel. Oh, you got mac and cheese? But Pointer didn't even know the term for her problem until a few years ago. That's because misophonia is still such a new concept, even people who have it might not know about it. In terms of empirical research that has been conducted, it's only been 
very recently. I only know of one other study that was published earlier this year. That's Mirren Edelstein, a psychology doctoral student at UC San Diego. In a study published earlier this year, she and her colleagues confirmed that, yes, misophonia is very much real, and it's a lot worse than simply being annoyed by rude noises. These are the electrodes that we place on the participants' fingers. Edelstein brought a small group of people into the lab for an experiment. She hooked each of them up to a machine that measures the body's fight-or-flight response. Then she showed them some videos. In these videos, people are aggressively chewing apples, furiously clicking pens, and munching on potato chips. The fight-or-flight response charts taken from people with misophonia explain a lot. The lines start flat and calm at first, but when the videos start, they shoot right up. This would be an example of just a pretty large response. But why do we see this response? What's the underlying cause of misophonia? It's still way too soon to tell, but Edelstein and her colleagues have a hypothesis. It could be due to an enhanced connectivity between the auditory cortex of the brain, so where sounds are processed, and the limbic system, basically where your body's emotional and fight and flight response are processed. Basically, maybe people with misophonia have more connections linking the sound and emotion parts of their brain. The key word here is maybe. It's going to take lots of brain scanning before we can say anything even remotely conclusive about misophonia. But for people living with it, the fact that scientists are looking into their condition at all is encouraging. Now disorders and, and things like bipolar, OCD, it's just like common talk, you know? So maybe someday it's like misophonia will be understood like that and not this just weird, quirky thing that a few of us say we have. People with misophonia say public awareness would make their lives a little easier. Then at least they wouldn't have to spend so much time explaining why you really should stop tapping your feet and snapping your gum. David Wagner, KPBS News. A San Francisco company is taking paperless to the next level, converting all conventional mail and sending it to your smartphone or tablet. The story from Matt Friedman of the Associated Press. It's been a long time since the U.S. mail was delivered by horse and buggy, but bringing letters and packages to every address in the country has been a mandate for the Postal Service for nearly two centuries. <laughs> Fast forward to now. Letter carriers still sort the mail and bring it to you six days a week, but email and modern mobility have radically altered the landscape. It's not that people don't like mail. It's that they don't like the negative attributes of mail that don't line up with their lives. What if you never had to deal with physical mail again? That's the promise of a new company called Outbox. Right now, without changing your address, you can sign up for Outbox in about 30 seconds. And the next day, you're completely paperless. Outbox relies on what it calls unpostmen. Pay $5 a month and provide a key, and you'll never have to see the paper mail again. The company scans the mail so you can read it on your iPad or other digital device. All the junk mail that I received was right there, and I could hit the unsubscribe button and it'll never get printed again and I can put the rest of it into folders. The, uh, the stuff I do actually physically want I can ask for and they'll make sure that I get it in my, my mailbox. Outbox's new approach may work well for some customers but the company has a long way to go to topple the postal service which delivers to more than 150 million addresses. Matt Friedman, Associated Press. A San Diego musician is being honored as a living legend. It's the first in a string of awards for 76-year-old saxophonist Daniel Jackson, and he's heading to Los Angeles to receive it. KPBS culture reporter Angela Carone joins us from the News Center with the story. Angela, you did a feature on Daniel Jackson earlier this year. What else can you tell us about him? Well, Jackson is a founding father of San Diego's jazz scene. He plays both saxophone and piano. He's lived here his whole life. In fact, he still lives in the house he grew up in in southeast San Diego. And it was there that he heard the tenor sax for the first time. He was a little boy, and he would sit and listen to his brother's band as they practiced in the front room. And he heard the sax, and Jackson says he was hooked. I heard this tenor saxophone. I was like, okay, that's it. That's where I want to be for the rest of my life, is on that sound. And Jackson has had an impressive career, even touring with the uh, late Ray Charles. Tell us about the awards he's received. 
Well, tomorrow he'll be one of three musicians getting an award from the Living Legend Foundation in Los Angeles, which honors African-American musicians. Jackson says this award is special because, as he put it, it's black people honoring black people. Then coming up in October, he'll receive the Lifetime Achievement Award at the San Diego Music Awards. He told me today that the awards are great and he's honored to get them, but his main goal is to play music every day as often as he can. KPBS culture reporter Angela Carell. I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next News Hour, we continue our look back at the March on Washington 50 years on with Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. Well, let's take a look at our next uh, three days uh, of weather here in San Diego. We'll start with morning clouds along the coast, uh, partly cloudy by afternoon, temperatures mostly in the mid 70s. Inland temperatures. Uh, in the 80s with more sunshine there. Mid to upper 80s expected in the mountain areas and plenty of heat in the desert, reaching well above 100 degrees over the next few days. Recapping tonight's top stories, Mayor Bob Filner made an appearance at his office today, the first since taking time off for therapy. Filner is also in mediation with lawyers and city officials regarding his political future. Today, another woman has come forward alleging sexual misconduct. The pain at the pump the pain at the pump is easing up a bit. San Diego County gas prices fell for the 29th consecutive day. The average for self-serve regular down to $3.86. That's down two-tenths of a percent. Now, the average price for a gallon of gas has actually dropped 21 cents in the past month. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Good night.